Welcome to Willard Church of the Nazareth. We're glad you're here. We can't wait to share the service with you.
You would turn in your Bibles to um, Habakkuk, Habakkuk, Habakkuk 1. If you, if you turn to Matthew and go back five books, that's how you can find Habakkuk. If you're not familiar with that is, I'd have to use the, the front part to, to find that book. Habakkuk is unlike uh, any other books of the prophets. Habakkuk was a prophet, but in this book, instead of Habakkuk giving a message to the people, instead we have this conversation that we see between this prophet and God. It's his prayer. And in the portion that we're going to read today, it is a complaint that Habakkuk gives to God. God answers him, and then Habakkuk doesn't understand God's answer, and he kind of questions it. But I think we're going to see that it's very fitting to maybe our world today. Habakkuk 1.1, would you stand in honor of God's word? The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence, But you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians with that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are feared and dreaded people. They are a law unto themselves. They promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swooping to devour. They, they all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities by building earthen ramps that they, by building earthen ramps, they capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their God. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with their hooks. He catches them in, their, in, them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet, and so he rejoices and, glad, and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, would you speak to us directly? Lord, reveal your truth. Nobody's interested in hearing what a a man or a person behind this pulpit has to say. We want to hear directly from you. Holy Spirit, you have right away. Speak to our hearts. Speak directly to us, Lord. Transform us by your word. Hide it in our hearts so that we may may remember it in days when we need it, Lord. Father, let us be a a people that build our lives upon it. Let us be people that uh, when our lives don't agree with it, that we repent and come in line with what you teach us, with what you tell us. Lord, we thank you for it. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So Habakkuk starts out with a complaint. 
with some questions for God. Maybe these are similar questions that you have asked God. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you don't listen? I cry violence. I, I point out violence, right? But you do not save. Have you ever get, asked God, where are you? What, what's going on? Why aren't you moving? Why aren't you doing something about this situation? Lord, I, I need your help, right? If you're like me, you've, you've been in that season. Verse 3, why do you make me look at injustice? Injustice meaning sorrow or grief. In other words, why have you put me in this position where I see evil and you do nothing about it? In Ecclesiastes 9.12, there's a very interesting verse that goes like this, as fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. Right before this period that Habakkuk is living in, there was a king named Josiah, and he ruled over Judah. Josiah was a, a good king, and he gave the people hope, right? Hope of a better future. Anytime Israel or Judah had a good king, it seemed like God's blessings were upon them, right? So the people looked forward, looked ahead, and they thought good times were coming, but Josiah had wicked sons. And when one took over, uh, corruption and injustice came upon the land. So there were evil times. That's what Habakkuk is looking at. That's what, why he is questioning, why isn't God doing something about it? Evil times. Uh, end of verse 4. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Have you ever saw evil prosper, right? And get away with things while the good seem to fall? seem to struggle? Why, God, do you do nothing about that? We, we, we all go through bad times. Oftentimes, though, I think we think or we have hope that times will get better, though. Times are going to improve. Uh, from the 1870s to 1910, in, in North America and in Europe, uh, that's how everybody felt, right? Times were just going to get better and better good times. We're, we're experiencing them and, and better days are ahead. Uh, they might have had a bad year here and there, but by and large, they thought they had hope that better times were coming. But the first half of the 20th century was what? It was, it was rough, right? You had World War I. You had the Great Depression. You had a worldwide depression. You had World War II, and you had things like the Holocaust, right? By the end of the 1940s, thousands of people were starving to death uh, every winter in Europe. During that period of time, many, especially in Europe, they didn't think things would get better. They didn't have hope that things would get better. There was little hope for them. Those were evil times that hemmed in the righteous, right? Decade after decade, problem after problem. There was a preacher named um, David Martin Lloyd in London that was preaching in the 1950s. And Habakkuk is the book that he chose to talk to them because that spoke to the time that they were dealing with. When you, when you think about what they were going through in Europe, right, with two world wars and all that devastation and bombing and, and just militaries running through everything and destroying everything, right? Those were, were dark times, and Habakkuk helps people in those types of times. Habakkuk is the book that helps people that feel like they've been abandoned by God. There are some heavy things going on in people's lives in this church, Right? Uh, heavy things going on in people's lives with their loved ones in this church. Our, our economy, we said it, I said it, is not the best right now. Our culture is not the friendliest towards Christians. We, we see uh, the God of the Bible mocked again and again, right? Evil seems to be prospering today. Dark times, how do you handle those? Who do you turn to? Right? I, I think we can see Habakkuk was bold. 
I think we can get answers from him. Bold and honest in his prayers. Verse 3, he asks God, why do you tolerate wrongdoing? That's a bold statement, right? That's an honest statement. He's challenging God. In verse 12, he says, Lord, are you not from everlasting? Uh, That comes across a lot softer in our English, but for the Hebrew person uh, hearing that, that would have come across very confrontative. Uh, uh, Rhetorical question, yes. Are you not eternal? Are you not able to do something about this? You you, you are this great God, infinite, wise, everlasting. Um, Or am I wrong, right? It should hit us because God is not to be approached uh, like that, like, like Habakkuk does right there. But we have to remember where Habakkuk is, and I think that's what God looks at, right? Habakkuk is in absolute anguish for his nation. He's watching his country turn their back on God. Does that sound familiar with you? Look at my culture. Look at my my nation. You're supposed to be bringing salvation out of this nation, out of Israel into the world, but it's all corrupt right now. It's all going to you know where, right? It's a mess. Why are you letting evil, why are you letting injustice control your nation? And, And we could probably ask the same thing today. It's getting crazy, right? Everything is corrupt. Look at our government. God answers Habakkuk in verses 5 to 11. Basically, he tells him what he's up to. Hey, I'm raising up the Babylonians. I'm going to bring in the most ruthless, bloodthirsty people that the world has ever seen, and they are going to sweep over everything, including the nation of Israel, including the nation of Judah. They're going to conquer this nation. And Habakkuk says, basically, are you serious? Right? That's your answer? Are you not from everlasting? Why do you tolerate the treacherous? I don't get it. I don't get your plan. What are you doing? What's happening here? Uh, Habakkuk is wrestling with God, right? Pure and simple. That's really the first thing he does. He's having an honest conversation with God and just putting it out there. Um, In our lives, this is going to be the place where we sometimes find ourselves in. And praise God for his mercy because he allows it, right? He gives us the grace to come before him with these types of questions, really with with even accusations. Now, to Habakkuk's credit, he challenges God on, on one hand, but he never hints, though, at walking away from him right? He never hints at not obeying him. He's not going to turn his back on God because of these things that he doesn't uh, understand. That's never an option. Yes, he, he thinks, he knows he doesn't understand. He thinks, you know, he wonders why God is doing this, why God is allowing this. I don't, I don't get it, right? But he doesn't go on a blog. He doesn't go around to people sharing why God is, is wrong and, and how bad God is, right? He doesn't take this as an opportunity to step away from his faith and, and, and make this publicly known and, and complain about God and then try to get attention from it, right? Not him. He's praying this. That's what we need to understand. This is a private conversation between him and God. This is a, a one-on-one conversation, and he's trying to honestly get somewhere with God. That's, that's what we need to keep in mind when we wrestle with God ourselves. Verse 12 might be one of the most insulting things that you could say to God. That's what a lot of people feel. But then he follows it up with, my God, my Holy One, right? You will never die. I read from a pastor that said he was faithfully wrestling with God. There's a difference between wrestling and faithfully wrestling. Some people think, oh, you never should question God. Don't you dare do that. You better not, or he could wipe you out or smite you. Right? On the other side of that, though, is this thought that you, can, you just don't see any way that God can bring anything good out of this or what he's doing, so you just uh, step away from him and not follow him. I'm out, right? Habakkuk doesn't do either of those extremes. He's wrestling with God, but at the same time, he has unconditional faith in God. I love that God chose to make this scripture a part of the Bible. 
I love that it is passed down to us today. The very presence of such prayers in Scripture, right? It's a witness to God's understanding. It's a witness to his grace. It's a witness to his being slow to anger, right? And understanding that his children sometimes have questions, sometimes don't get it, and sometimes we bring those to him. He doesn't stop talking to Habakkuk, right? Or reject him because of his questions. He talks to him and he he preserves these prayers so that future generations could know more about him. Okay, what about God's answers? Verses 5 and 6. Habakkuk, I'm going to come and do something that you won't believe. You're not going to believe this, Habakkuk, right? I'm going to raise up these ruthless Babylonians and they're going to sweep over the land. Lord, that doesn't make sense to me. Habakkuk knew the promises of God. He knew that there was a promise to bring salvation out of the nation of Israel for all people, right? How could bringing more injustice, how could bringing more cruelty from the Babylonians figure into that? God's answer, you won't understand. You won't get it, right? And here's something I I think that we need to learn. Um, Why can't Habakkuk understand it? I think because our view is limited by our own timetables. Our view is limited by our own measurements. Our view is limited by our own calendars, right? Here's what he couldn't see. Here's where he he couldn't understand it. You see, when the Jews were conquered, right, what happened to them? They're scattered all over the world. In every major city, there was a settlement of Jewish people that were brought into it. And what did they do when they got there? They built synagogues. They built these places that other people in the city could come and learn about God. And and there were these Gentiles, right? They were these non-Jewish people that became parts of these synagogues. They they are referred to as God-fearers, right? They were people who began to look for God, began to study his word. They were interested to, to know him. And it's interesting that if you look, when Christianity began to spread, right, you can see this all through the book of, of Acts, the most receptive people to the gospel message were the god Some of the Jews accepted it, but it was really these Gentiles who were trying to figure it out, trying to find out who this God was. They're the ones who became the Christians. They're the ones where this faith was spread through. They're the ones who embraced it, right? The Greeks conquered everyone after it. And what did the Greeks do? The Greeks brought a common language. So at the first time in the history of mankind, somebody could write a book over here, and that book could be distributed everywhere, and everybody could understand it, right? How would that play a role in the spread of Christianity? What book do we know of, right? The Romans came in, they conquered everybody, they brought roads and they brought travel and and, and a peaceful time where people could could move around, right? All these things happened at just the right time and just the right way to see the gospel spread. The good news spread like it never could have without these things. Here's the irony, right? The violence of these nations, of the Babylonians, of the Greeks, of the Romans, caused Christianity to spread in a way that wouldn't have happened if they didn't happen. Do you you think Habakkuk could have seen that? Do you think Habakkuk could have understand it? We, We barely can, right? And we're looking back through time. Not too long ago, communism took over China, and they knocked out all the Western missionaries. We all thought, oh no, this is horrible, right? 100 years of Christian missionary work down the drain. They've been kicked out. People were wondering, why did God let this happen? What are you doing, Lord? Why is God abandoning China, right? But because the missionaries were kicked out, something interesting happened. The Chinese people themselves took over their own faith, right? And today, it's estimated that there are 100 million people Christians in the nation of China. It is the fastest growing mission field that we know about. In a matter of decades, they could reach 300 million people. And these aren't people like us Americans. These are people with radical faith. These are people born of persecution, right? We might be on that way coming into that, 
But these are people that have to make a choice. If I'm going to follow Christ, right, what am I going to have to give up? We can follow Christ and not give up anything here in America. That's why our faith is so lacking. These people, though, they're vital. Their, their faith is strong, right? People are believing that the nation of China is going to change the world. What will happen? What will God do in the next coming decades through this nation? I don't know. Look at Joseph, right? Part of a family of deceivers. If you heard my sermon at the community service, Joseph was spoiled by his father, right? Gave him that nice coat. And his brothers hated him because of it. His brothers sold him into slavery. Slavery, being thrown into prison after that, adjusted his course and turned him into the man that God could use, a man that uh, Egypt would use and see God's deliverance from a famine that hit them hard, right? They would have starved to death if all of the bad things wouldn't have happened to Joseph. Joseph knew what his brothers meant for evil, God used for good. That's a phrase that we have to memorize and get into our hearts today, right? Joseph lived through 20 years where everything went wrong. He does the right thing, and it just gets worse every time, right? Do you think he prayed, why God? Do you think he wondered, what are you doing, Lord? Why have you abandoned me in this foreign nation? Why are you letting me rot away in this prison, right? But he came to understand through years, through perspective, what God was doing. He came to see his hand, right? And how he delivered him and saved an entire region through what he had to go through. We sit here. We look at what's happening to our nation or what's happening to our brothers or sisters or our own lives with medical diagnoses, right? And we, and we wonder and we pray, why God, right? We question him. How could you let this happen? Why, do, why does evil prosper? When I'm busting it, when I'm giving to you, right, and it seems like I can't get ahead with anything, why, why don't you do something? Why aren't you changing this? right? Or we have so-called Christians who come in and say, you know what, if you just had enough faith, you'd be okay. You'd be healthy and wealthy, right? If you were just enough of a righteous person, everything would be okay. If you just claimed it in Jesus' name, right, things would change and he would fix everything and you wouldn't have to go through a lion's den, right? It just further confuses us. We, we have these, we hear these things and we just say, I don't get it, God, sometimes. Aren't you eternal? Aren't you everlasting? Aren't you all-powerful? Aren't you good, God? To Habakkuk, God answers, I'm going to tell you, can you hear this today? But you won't understand it. You won't believe what I'm going to do. You can't fathom it. Here it is, Babylonians. That's your answer, Lord? What in the world? If you're a parent, right, you know this, though. If you've, if you've maybe you're not a parent, but you've ever had to deal with small kids, uh, they've asked us questions at times that are just beyond them, that we can give them an answer, but they just aren't ready. They just aren't mature enough to, to get it, right? It's beyond their understandings. Sometimes we, we knew that we couldn't just explain it to them uh, because of that. Right? You can sit them down and, and, some, and tell them that candy you can't eat all the time. Right? You can explain to them about a, a good nutrition and everything like that. But to a, to a three-year-old, that's going to be beyond them. So you say, what? You're just going to have to trust me on this. That's what we tell our teens. That's what we tell our, our, our young people. Right? You're just going to have to trust me on this. It, it might not make sense to you right now, but it will someday. That's us in God, though, that same situation. That's us in God on a much bigger level. His ways are far beyond us, though, compared to a kid and an adult. His ways, man, they, they would just blow our mind. We don't even come close. We just have to trust God. And when we can't, right, where do you turn? How do you, how do you handle that? When you just need an answer. When you just want an answer, 
when the wicked seem to prosper, right? In Acts chapter 13, verse 41, Paul says this amazing statement. Uh, right before that, though, he leads up to it in verse 38. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. Amen? Right? A justification you are not able to obtain under the law of Moses. You couldn't do it, right? Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. Sound familiar? Paul's looking back at Habakkuk 1.5, and he's comparing it with the cross. That's what he's doing, right? That's what he's talking about. God's about to bring light out of darkness, or he has brought light out of darkness. Salvation out of injustice, right? The cross made no sense at the time. Do you, do you get that? Do you realize that? Think about what the disciples must have thought. Everything was going good. Momentum was building. They were having more and more faith in this man, that he was truly the Son of God, that he was the Messiah. They were buying into his teachings more and more, right? They saw a person raised from the dead. They saw him speak over raging waters, and they saw them be calm. They saw this man enter the, the city of Jerusalem with people shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, right? But a few days later, on a lonely night, they see Jesus praying, Lord, if it's at all possible, take this cup from me, right? But not my will be done, your will be done. He gets up, a, a mob comes, shows up. Jesus is arrested. What, what's going on here? I thought he was the Messiah. This shouldn't be happening. Okay, maybe this is part of the plan, right? He's tried. He's mocked. He's beaten unrecognizable. Do you think they're wondering what's going on at this moment? I don't get it. The crowd calls for his crucifixion. No, this can't be, right? He's paraded through the streets like a common criminal. He's brought up a hill at the city gates, and he's crucified. Why God? This isn't supposed to happen this way, right? He's innocent. Why, God, are you letting it happen? Why are you letting evil win? We left everything to follow him. We believed he was the Messiah, right? We believed he was the Son of God, and here he is, hanging on a cross, and then he dies. Remember what happens? The earth shakes. Darkness. There is no light. Darkness comes over the land for hours. There's no hope in this moment for them. There's none, right? Everything that they believed has just been rocked. They're, they're questioning everything. There's, there's no getting out of this. There's no Jesus to raise Jesus, right? He's dead. Why? Why, right? In that moment, on that Friday, right, it's the worst day of their lives. The worst day by far. From, from their perspective, it couldn't get any worse. For a couple of days, they, they wander around, I'm sure, wondering, Why? Why is this happening, right? Were we fooled? Were we wrong to follow this man? But what happens? On the third day, they get a glimmer of hope, right? They hear a rumor from some women. His body's gone. It's not there. He's alive, right? They would come to learn that he was raised from the dead. They would meet him right after he was raised from the dead. And they would come to see how God brought salvation out of injustice, out of cruelty, right? What they thought was the worst day of their lives 
completely changed in a matter of days, right? No longer was it the worst day. No, what a good day. We today, right? The day our Lord was crucified, we today call it Good Friday, right? Why? It's the day that our sins were paid for. The debt that we owed, right, was paid for by Jesus' sacrifice. Oh, what a day, right? That, that's the day that we received the greatest gift known to mankind. Amen? Stand with me. My friends, today you may be in the darkness. The sun may not be shining for you. You may feel like the God of the universe has abandoned you. You may be wondering and not understanding what is he doing. You may be praying. You may be wrestling with him, asking him those very questions, Lord. Why? Why, why is this happening? But you must understand that God is able to bring good out of the darkness, right? He is able to bring salvation from injustice. He brings beauty from pain. That's who our God is. That's the God that we serve today, right? His, his ways are far above our ways. I just want to encourage you, if you find yourself in that season today or in that season in, in a couple days or years or whatever, right, have faith. Have faith. Trust him. You, you may be on Friday and it's horrible, but Sunday's coming, right? There's hope because he is eternal. He is able to do anything. Sunday changes how you see Friday completely, right? Is your Sunday coming? With our God, I know it is. That's just who he is, right? You can't see it now. You don't understand it now. You're wondering what in the world is going on. Why does evil seem to prosper? Why is our nation going in the direction that it is? Why have I gotten this diagnosis? Why do my loved ones have this diagnosis? Right? Lord, why do you see like why does it seem like you're doing nothing? Why is it so dark? Our God brings light from the darkness. Our God brings goodness from the pain. Amen. Pray with me. Father, I know people are dealing with things. I know I, I've been asking why God with some things. But Lord, we just want to put our faith in you and put our trust in you and just lay these things down at your feet, Lord, because we know you are at work. Your ways are far beyond anything that we could understand, Lord. Lord, you might be bringing salvation from, for a loved one through whatever's going on. Lord, we can't see it. Lord, we just want to trust you with it, though. Father, I pray that if anybody's struggling with that thought today, I pray that they would be reminded when they look to the cross what you did, what you're able to do. The worst day in a believer's life and a disciple's life turned to such a good day. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. Lord, we love you and we give you all praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.